There is a huge disconnect between what's going on with the politics and then the, the, the science and what actually is required. World leaders in Paris accepted 1.5 degrees Celsius as a new icon for limiting global warming. But does this replacement for 2 degrees have any basis in science, or is it purely political? What would it take to get to 1.5 degrees? And, in the face of worsening climate change, are we as a developed society doing enough? More than 190 flood alerts and warnings have been issued across England and Wales as Britain braces for torrential rain and further flooding on Boxing Day. Now, some parts of the world are threatened already. And when you have extreme precipitation events, we've seen that in several parts of the world, where you get a sudden downfall in a very short period of time. And that's a risk to life and property and also a serious problem with respect to availability of water. So what I'm saying is that even with 1.5 degrees Celsius, the impacts are going to be pretty serious and will require a huge amount of effort and resources at adaptation. So it's a, it's a value judgment. Human society has to decide. The vulnerable developing countries are arguing, like the small island states, for the target to be set at one and a half even if it's extremely difficult. Because we believe that it may be difficult, but it's not impossible. We are, we are heading towards somewhere between a three and five degree C temperature rise by the end of the century. I mean, that's a global average, so that doesn't sound so bad if you come from where, you know, I come from living near Manchester, and that doesn't sound too bad on a cold November or December day. But this is a global average, and that also means, of course, that the, the seas take longer to warm up. So that means the land average will be above that anyway, by a degree or so. And then we think, well, what are the regional variations of that? Well, even a two degree sea rise is a six degree sea rise in the, in the poles. So very big regional variations. And then you say, well, what's the, what is the climate signal during, during the extreme weather event? So for instance, a four degree sea temperature rise would be, a, would be somewhere like eight, eight degree sea temperature rise during a heat wave across Europe. And you start to think of the 2003 heat wave, heat wave and add eight degrees on top of that and possibly it could last for longer and you start to see that this, this could have dire repercussions. So we are heading in that sort of direction of four degrees C average temperature rise by the end of the, by the, end of the uh, century. We are headed for well over three degrees. That's what is called the business as usual scenario. I think everyone agrees, you know, that three, four, five. It's just a different planet. That's a planet that no one wants to live on. I, I, I think you might even get uh, a denier to agree, would you like to live on a world that's, you know, five Celsius warmer than today? I think they would say no. What we are committed to, our obligation, our repeated obligation has been to have a, to have a good chance, a very good chance of staying below two degrees C. The difference between those two is, is absolutely enormous. You know, one requires a fundamental reshaping of our energy system, of our agricultural system, and of much of the social and economic framing of society in terms of at least in the short term, in terms of how we are living our lives and the sorts of ways that we live our lives, because it's so dominated by energy, which is fed by fossil fuels. Um, and in the longer term, it means us making this full transition away from a fossil fuel energy system. Um, at, at the latest, I would say, by 2050. And for the wealthier parts of the world, considerably before that. So I would argue that 2030 to 2035 is really when the, you know, the EU, the US and so forth need to have moved away from fossil fuels and that the rest of the world needs to have made that move by 2050. That's a huge ask. We now have promises from well over 150 countries to reduce emissions. These are called INDCs in our jargon. Basically mitigation plans from all the countries, developed and developing countries, and they've made promises to reduce their emissions. If you take those promises on, on face value and you add them all up, it will take us down to 2.7 degrees. So we still have a long way to get to two degrees, an even longer way to go to one and a half if we wanted to change the goal from two to one and a half. We have to be able to suck the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere at some point in the future with some technology, which we don't currently have, or, but it's almost or and, I think it's probably as we are now. Um, we have to assume that emissions of carbon dioxide emissions will peak very early. So when we look at the sets of scenarios that have informed the IPCC process, the sets of the scenarios, for instance, that have informed the carbon budgets um, adopted by the UK government, they are premised both on very early peaks in emissions, often naively early peaks, either like 2015 or 2016, or some of the scenarios considerably before today. So you'd have to be you know, peaking emissions in 2010, 2011, 2012, but we're already in 2016 today, so yeah, peaking emissions in the past, 
we may say that's time travel. Um, and as well as that, we would have to be sucking the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere in the future in very large quantities. If you put those together, that will allow you to roughly hit the carbon budgets from the IPCC for a two degrees C temperature rise. The pushback we get is, be realistic, not going to happen. Well, you know, uh, then we have to live with the consequence that hundreds of millions of people living in the most vulnerable areas are being written off. So what the world leaders in Paris are saying, if they accept a two degree global goal, is that for the poorest of the poor and most vulnerable, we're not going to be able to protect you. We will protect ourselves, but we won't protect you because it's too difficult for us to reduce our emissions to be able to protect you. And that's a very bad message for leaders to have here. I must admit, I find it quite extraordinary when you hear policymakers saying, well, we just, we can't stay below two, two, two degrees. If we, if we try and do that, you know, it's going to stop our economies growing or, or whatever. You know, there are some scientific realities here. We have a planet of finite resources. We have an atmosphere that can only absorb a certain amount of greenhouse gases without triggering climate catastrophe. The catastrophes we see today from extreme weather events are expected to worsen in coming years. One key concern among scientists are the feedback mechanisms within the climate system that behave like irreversible tipping points. Once they are crossed, the climate response cannot be reversed. Such feedbacks include sea level rise or an abrupt spike in temperature. There are many scientists already who think that a 2 degree C temperature rise, if we head towards that sort of level, already will be too high. That what we will do, we will kick in into train a, a series of these what are called positive feedbacks. I mean, they're not very positive, they're, they're bad for us, but they make the situation worse. So these positive feedbacks. Now, ac across the scientific community, there's a lot of uncertainty about exactly when those feedbacks will kick in, at what sort of temperatures they would kick in. Nevertheless, there's a fairly high degree of uh, you know, consensus, if not um, unanimous agreement, that as the temperature goes higher, the probability of these kick feedbacks kicking in goes up. The, the biggest threat to uh, a very rapid warming in temperature or an abrupt climate change is the threat to, we have to eat food, we have to grow food. And uh, what happens is uh, we get areas that are, get torrential rain events which flood out crops. We also get areas that are very arid deserts, for example. The Southern California, U.S. Southwest um, food production could be severely stunted. Um, that drought will likely continue, could continue for decades, and that's the breadbasket for fruits in the, in the U.S., for example. But for politicians, taking action isn't always so straightforward. Industries that are the cause of our problems also provide jobs and economic benefits for their regions. One example is Canada's oil sands in the Alberta province. Regarded as the most toxic fossil fuel on the planet, they remain the backbone of the Canadian and the Alberta economy. When I asked the new minister for the environment in Alberta, Shannon Phillips, if she foresaw a time when the oil sands might close, she replied. Um, you know, I don't think that's fair. I don't think it's a fair question, right? The global economy is but moving in the ways it, it is. I don't think that anyone wants to uh, shut down their main industry as an aspirational goal of government. Whenever politicians are confronted by this conflict between supporting dangerous industries like fossil fuels and longer term ambitions for a safer world, they might consider this perspective presented by Michael Bloomberg. Compare jobs versus lives. If we will lose one job and save five lives, or keep that job and lose five lives, is that the right trade-off? Nobody really wants to focus on that issue. We all talk about, oh, there's some jobs at stake. There are jobs at stake in every industry. The world is changing. Every industry has a disruptive technology coming along. They change their processes. But we have, as a world, been able to create more jobs in most parts of history as things change. It's not done a very good job recently, but and, and hopefully this is just a temporary thing, but nevertheless, you're going to always lose some jobs. You're going to always create some other jobs in some ratio. The real question is, what's the impact on human lives? But all of this is designed to give us a planet that we'll, we'll survive on, and in the meantime, to help those who can't take care of themselves. And if you think about it, most places where climate change will really kill people and change their ability to survive are in poor places close to the water. 
I think what we're witnessing right now is kind of the, the last death throes, I hope, of a fossil fuel industry that is lobbying governments like mad because they can see the, the writing on the wall. I do believe it's possible to get away from, uh, from fossil fuels. Uh, we didn't end the Stone Age because we ran out of stones. We worked out better ways of doing things. And I'm fairly confident that if the political will is there, and if that means that if, if there's enough public pressure on politicians as well, of course we could get to 100% renewables by, by 2050. But we need the political will, and that's what this process is all about. That if we're serious about 2 degrees C, the rates of change are much more challenging than you can deliver with these incremental adjustments to the business as usual model. The rates of change are ones that ask profound and fundamental questions about how we're living our lives and about the technologies as well. And that's a much more revolutionary context where we're going to have to start to question what our societies do, how we measure, how we think about a good society, a good quality life, all of those things, as I was touching on before, the sorts of metrics that we use to measure success and progress are all metrics that increase our carbon dioxide emissions. And we have to go back and revisit all of those almost overnight. So in that sense, it's a revolution. If that hadn't, we had to do that over the next 50 or 100 years, perhaps that would be fine. We have to do that over the next five years. Then that, that becomes a revolution. And until we actually recognize that we are, we are asking fundamental questions of our existing economic and social paradigm and political paradigm, rather than questions that can be answered within the existing social, political and economic paradigm. A very few people who look at climate change, who work on it in any level of detail, really think we can hold to two degrees C without some revolutionary adjustments to, the, to how we frame our society, even though publicly it makes it something quite different.